All right, so now we're really getting into what to eat. Veggies, yay, veggies. So what do I mean when I say veggies? Throw them at me. What are veggies? Come on. Spinach. Spinach, love it. Brussels sprouts. Kale. Broccoli, kale, cauliflower. All those things are lovely. Potato, oh, potatoes, maybe. Maybe, squash, yes, squash, love squash. Squash is good. Okay, so there are three pitfalls with veggies. Corn gets classified as a vegetable, right? If it's fresh corn, if it's corn niblets, we get to call it a vegetable. That's what they do in the school system. Yeah, we call it, we call it a veggie. What's corn really? <laughs> I like that, nothing. <laughs> it's a grain. Corn is actually a grain. Potatoes, well, those are tricky. Sweet potatoes, not so much tricky. <coughs> Sweet potatoes are generally pretty darn good. Potatoes are tricky for the reason that we have these big ass, large, russet potatoes, big Idaho potatoes, size of your frickin' head. Real potatoes, like, <laughs> little tiny, tiny things. Fingerlings, you've probably seen them in the store, yeah? Mixed bag, they red and purple and golden, they're really pretty, love those purple ones. That is a different thing than those big ones. Do, we, do you guys know why those big potatoes exist? Why they're the size they are? And like the French fries. Yes, absolutely right. McDonald's, McDonald's wanted to make sure that they got a consistent product so that every time it, they cut into it, the starch content was the same and other, you know, it was across the board the same so that when they deep fried it, it was beautifully golden consistently across the board. So our potatoes were bred for that purpose, for looks, not for nutrition. So they've been kind of just bred out of having any kind of nutrition, really. There's some good potassium in there, sure, but so is banana. <laughs> um, so potatoes, that's kind of why, potatoes also just take the place for a lot of people because they count them as a vegetable. So they're like, I got my veggies in, I got my potatoes. It's like, there's not a damn green thing on your plate. <laughs> like your plate was white, <laughs> we like color. Um, and actually, speaking of the potato and the size of the potato, that's actually why chicken breasts are as big as they are. Because let's go back to World War II again. So in World War II, it was considered, um, you know, we had to save the meat to send the troops. So what were people eating back home? Chicken. We did not used to eat this level of chicken. Chicken has uh, like skyrocketed. We eat like 120% more chicken than we ever have historically. Same thing with fish. It's kind of crazy, right? Those were not normal proteins. Has anybody ever been around like actual chickens, like layers? Yeah. They got no boob, none whatsoever. And if you, my mother raises them, two and a half pounds at the most, that chicken, when we, when we actually finally butcher it, nothing. <laughs> like, and if I want to eat it, I got to stew it for like three days because it's just, they're tough. It tastes amazing when you finally get the meat, but it's like this little teeny tiny taste of chicken. It's the most chickeny chicken ever, so it's filling. But nonetheless, so, I believe it was Tyson, it might be Purdue, one of the big manufacturers, was really, really worried that they were about to lose their audience when World War II came to an end. And they were like, crap, how do we not lose our money? Well, we gotta make sure we're growing really big breasts really fast so that we, don't, so that we can sell them for cheap. So they did a nationwide competition and they had a, a wax model of the size of the breast of what they wanted it to look like. They said, get us this as fast as you can. Again, nothing to do with nutrition, nothing to do with taste. That's why chicken breast is just generally so bull. <sighs> Which is, God bless the people who do the bodybuilding diet where all they eat is like plain chicken breast and rice and broccoli all day long. I do not understand how you could live that way, but more power to you, I guess. Um, but yeah, so there's just, like they're super bland and they're huge and they're just not what they're supposed to be. So, quick note on that. Beans. Not all chicken breasts. Not all chicken breasts, you're right. <laughs> but what we have generally been calling chicken breasts up until relatively recently, yes. If you can get your hands on pasture raised, ladies, awesome sauce. And a, actually, quick note on that one. If you can get pasture raised local, even better. And. Vegetarian feed is not actually want, what you want your chickens on. <laughs> chickens are omnivores. Worms, flowers. Rats. <laughs> they get a, if they get a rat in their coop, they'll eat it. They eat each other. Chickens are not pleasant. <laughs> they really aren't. They beat the crap out of each other. Some of my mom's lady, like they've just got bald spots. It's so mean. <laughs> one of her roosters killed the other one. I mean, that was a whole thing. Um, <laughs> the last pitfall is beans. 
Beans also get wrapped up into that veggie category. But botanically, what are they called? Legumes. Legumes, yeah. So they're a little different category than veggies. Beans are kind of an interesting one. I had a professor when I was doing my training who did not understand how you could have a diet that was healthy without beans. She just like could not wrap her brain around this concept. And there was another big dog in the nutrition world who came in and was talking about paleo eating and how her daughter does paleo eating. She's like, actually, it's a really great model. It's based on a lot of science. It's not a fad diet. There's like a lot of science behind it. And she was like, but I just, how can you have a diet that's healthy without beans? It's like, let's look at all the places in the world <laughs> that don't include beans in their diet and are still plenty healthy. The thing is, is beans are often where people get a lot of fiber in their life. They probably don't get it a whole lot of other places. But what else has fiber? Fruits and vegetables, <laughs> right? And also, we might not be needing as much fiber as we think we are if we can fix everything else. So I'm going to tell a little story. We might have to cut this one out of the video because it's a little racy. <laughs> fiber, why we're obsessed with fiber in our country. Do you guys know, does anybody know anything about fiber and Kellogg? So John Harvey Kellogg, John Harvey Kellogg was, very, was a very religious man. And he did not believe in any kind of sexual anything except for procreation, including masturbation. He was like, that is evil, 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 evil. He believed that if you ever had anything sitting in your bowel, it would push against the male prostate and cause an erection that he would then have to relieve through masturbation. And this was the devil's work. So how do you make sure that there's never anything in your colon? Fuck ton of fiber. <laughs> I, I'm not that seriously where it started. That is why we are now obsessed with this concept of fiber all the time. Also perhaps what? Stop in the That's true too. Like, right. So you also have right. So you also have the argument that constipation is actually more a, an issue of movement rather than or lack thereof, rather and positioning rather than actual nutrition. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I've got one. I love it. I love it. When I was excavating, there were certainly parts of the world where I, that was how you had to use the bathroom. There was no toilet in Ukraine. It just was. It was a hole <laughs> dug in the ground. So, yeah, absolutely. So, exactly. There's, there's the argumentation. And also, like, when we're all sitting, as we're all doing right now, what happens to our pelvis? We usually tuck it under, right? So then what happens to our colon is it's not, it, the gravity's not going straight down. You actually created a kink in your colon at that point. And so it's not functioning properly anymore. And most of us, when we stand up, our pelvis can't unhook from that position. And so we're still in that kind of nasty position. And, and then we try and overcompensate and we get lordosis and all this other crap. But if we can actually get that right, then you actually have gravity helping <laughs> everything come down. Instead of you're straining and you're stressing, you get to relax, right? Like usually relaxation is better when it comes to sphincters. Um, my husband hates when I use that word. Um, that's like his moist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that being, so yeah, exactly. And that's actually true with things like osteoporosis is there's the idea that it's actually not a nutritional issue, it's a movement issue. Because we consume more calcium as a country than any other nation in the world and yet we have the highest rate of osteoporosis and osteopenia. What the fuck? Well, because we're not, if you don't stress the bones, if you don't use the muscles to stress the bone, the bone has no need to continue to maintain any kind of structure there. The body is lazy. If it doesn't have to use it, it's going to dump it. Why waste the energy? So that's why weightlifters have super strong bones. That's why it's really important for women to lift weights. And they should be heavier than like 10 pounds, because let's be real. Our purses weigh 10 pounds. We can do that shit. <laughs> All right, so those are our three pitfalls. Now, those are also, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the issues with those when we talk about what to avoid and why they might not be the best option, okay? Part of it's just because for most people that takes up like most of their vegetable intake. There's just not a lot of variety there. And that's really what the name of the game is. Meat, all kinds. When I say the word meat, I don't just mean beef or red meat. That's often when, pe when people hear the word meat, they think of just those things. But I, like, I include chicken in that. I include eggs in that. I include all kinds of fish and seafood. Anything that was once living, breathing, walking, swimming, flying, you know, that, that all is in meat. And all kinds mix it up. So again, don't just stick to that chicken breast all day long. Don't do that. 
And also, who cares if it's lean? <laughs> Especially if you're getting quality. If you're getting good quality, you know, grass-fed, all those other things. Now, quick note on that. If you, I would rather you eat vegetables than stress out about always being perfect and making sure they're 100% organic and local and da da da. Yes, that is beautiful and that's where we'd love to be. But if it's a difference between eating McDonald's and eating conventional broccoli, can we still just eat the broccoli, please? Please, start there, start there. And then maybe start working towards the other stuff. And eventually, yes, it'd be lovely if we were all eating local stuff. Really, what would be great is if you were getting it from your neighbor and you were growing the tomatoes and you were swapping, that'd be sweet. Um, my mother is a botanist and has, done, uh, has been an educator for a method of agricultural management called the savory method or holistic land management my entire life. So I'm, I'm big on that side. But yeah, meat, mix it up, all kinds. The process of taking a piece of burger, making a burger from a cow, making a burger from a bunch of plants, there's a lot more steps involved in one than the other. Now granted, industrialized agriculture, industrialized animal husbandry is super messed up and it's causing huge issues. There's actually a movie right now that's being funded, hopefully please all of you go and fund this if you care about this thing at all, called Kale vs. Cow. And one of their taglines is, it's the how, not the cow. So the argument there is that a lot of the arguments that people make when it comes to, um, you know, we're killing the planet or, you know, some of the ethical things and all those other things is, is, is less to do with the utilization of the animal and more to do with the way we do it as a whole. But that you can then say that with soy production, you can say that with kale production, you can say that with any of these other things because all of them require stripping of land, killing of animals that are already there. I mean, you cannot grow any food without there being fallout and death and blood. It just is. You are killing gophers, you're killing rabbits, you're doing all of these other things, even if you're growing plants. Um, so my thing is, is <clears throat> with a lot of those foods and you start to see it in products too, like MCT oil, oh, that's a big pet peeve of mine, um, doesn't exist in nature that's really heavily derived fat, but we've managed to convince people that it's paleo somehow because it's quote unquote from coconut, but it's still been processed and stripped down and all these other things and you're not gonna find that in nature. So I have a hard time with these meat replacements because again, and then if you come from the purely physiological standpoint, how well is your body actually able to uh, absorb and utilize those versions of that, our bodies are really good at getting it from meat. Because part of what made us human and allowed us to be human was basically we got to outsource the work, right? Let the animal take the grass and turn it into meat because that's more nutrient dense and my body does a better job with that. Sweet. That's actually why some people would say we're not even omnivores, we're cookivores. Because it was really when we were able to cook. Because cooking is like doing food processing, like it's a stomach before it gets to your stomach. You started that process already of breaking it down so your body has to do just that little bit of extra, like less work to get the nutrition. So we then as humans, our guts could shrink and our brains could grow. Every other animal out there, their gut takes up way more energy than their brains do, especially those herbivores. Because they're spending all the time churning it and all these other things. So that's my feeling about that is, um, and it makes me wary because again, if you can use proper land management techniques, you can actually get a whole lot more uh, nutrition, calories, macros, all of those things from one acre of land than you can from, from farming by itself. So, all right. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Also with meat, mix it up. You know, don't eat different parts of the animal too. Eat the thigh of the chicken, eat the wing, you know, eat organ meats. <laughs> We're gonna talk about some of that in a little bit. So mix it up. Um, I will eat like three or four different protein sources in a day just to get the variety. And if you can get your hands on good quality venison, do it. So good. Actually, I'm super happy that like the only bars you guys have are Epic Bars. Like seriously, because like my favorite one is, where is it? I know I, I always have one with me. Well, no, not that one. I ha that's another Epic Bar. But is there venison? Epic Bar. These save me in my pregnancy, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and there's like nothing in here. This is like straight venison. Those are the bomb. And that's actually just like meat, right? Like that's not, I saw something today that was like bar, food doesn't come in bar form. Like, well, that's true. Real food doesn't come in bar form. And most bars are just sugar. But this, 
is really just jerky, right? This is, this is like an old school traditional way of processing meat. We've been doing this for thousands of years to preserve meat, so it's kind of different. Anyway, venison, good. Fruit, whole, seasonal is always best, yeah? So if you, again, we go back to that, because people get kind of wary of fruit because of the sugar in it, I think. You know, I, at least I know I've had plenty of people who talk to me, they're like, but it has sugar. Sugar's the devil. Sugar's gonna kill me. Well, from a chemical standpoint, sugar in fruit is yes, the same thing as sugar in the bowl. Yeah, you're gonna be getting the same thing. You're also getting other stuff. But you get other nutrition with the sugar that comes in the fruit, and your body has to do work to get at it. Because it has to break down the fiber, because that sugar is sequestered in little boxes, little cells. And the body actually has to break down those cells to get at the sugar. And you actually find that if you do eat food that's seasonal and local and all those other lovely buzzwords, that oftentimes, you know, you can have a, like, like a fruit that's in season and it just tastes amazing and it's like super sweet and just complex and all these other things. And then you'll bite into an, like an apple like way out of season and you're like, what is wrong with, like it just doesn't have any flavor to it whatsoever. And part of that's because there are all these other chemicals in the fruit that come together that make it taste sweeter than it actually might be. So it might actually be a trick. It might actually not be having that much more sugar in it, but it has other chemicals that even make it taste sweeter and make it taste more complex. Also, my thing with fruit and sugar is, so if you go down to South America, you're gonna find people chewing a leaf, coca leaf. It's their energy boost. It's like their espresso shot. They're walking around, they're doing it. Well, then people came in and said, hmm, what can we do with that? Can we, is there anything we can do to make some money off that? Okay, maybe we can uh, process it down and derive a white powder from it. Now we've got cocaine, yes! Makes so much more money. People in South America, they can be chewing the coca all the time. There's not addiction problems, there's not any of these other things because it's in the plant, right? Same thing with the fruit. Because we've actually done the same thing, right? We've derived it down to a white powder. <laughs> And it's a whole different thing. Now, I'm not saying cocaine and sugar. And, like, I know. Um, and I'm not trying to make that equation. Some people might make that equation. I'm not saying that. But, um, but it is a similar process. We've taken something in its natural context, and we've stripped it of everything. And we're trying to say it's the same thing. And then it also allows manufacturers to tell you, well, what does it matter? You're still getting the same amount of sugar. If you eat our food, we don't have any more than X, or it's the equivalent of eating five apples. It's like, yeah, but it's still not. No, it's not, because it's out of context. You do have to be aware of the amount with fruit, though. I do want to throw that out there, because I have had people I've worked with who, when I try and like, because most of us are eating more sugar than we think we are, and a lot of those dense carbs we talked about before, the breads, the rice, the pastas, they break down real fast into sugar in our body. And our body has been used to running off of that simple carbohydrate for a long time. So it loves it and it wants it. So I've had people that when I ask them to minimize that, they'll eat like, you know, two bags of cuties a day. <laughs> I love cuties, but that's a lot of flipping fruit in one day. It also means you're not eating vegetables, which is really what we want to be doing. But that's not to say that like right now, ruby red grapefruit season, go for it. I'll have four in a day, sure. And I probably won't eat any for three weeks, but <laughs> you know, so don't be scared of fruit. That's just kind of my little thing there. Nuts and seeds. Now, what are peanuts? Why are they on the, why I say not legumes? So they fall in that same category with beans. The other issue with why I put peanuts up there is because peanuts are another one that we've kind of derived a lot of crap from, like peanut oil. So it ends up being in a lot of stuff. So sometimes when I say like, don't do peanuts, it's also because like, if you read a label, it means you're probably not gonna eat it if it has peanut oil in it. So it's kind of a way to like get rid of processed food. <laughs> like it's kind of a marker. Because honestly, if you move into a space where you're eating real food most of the time and you wanna have some, you know, a handful of peanuts or even some peanut butter and you read the label and there's no added sugar and there's no crappy oils and stuff and it's like literally just ground peanuts and your body doesn't have a problem, it's probably okay. <laughs> probably not gonna kill yourself. <laughs> But we do want to be aware of butters, because if you think about it, that tablespoon of almond butter that we love so much, or peanut butter, how many almonds or peanuts went into making that one tablespoon? 
I don't even know the number, but a lot. <laughs> Way more than you would have eaten. And again, if we go back to the evolutionary side of things, pistachios are a great example, right? Because you have to crack them open and do the whole thing. It's a lot more work. <laughs> And the likelihood that you would actually even find a cache of like that many pistachios or that many almonds at one time. Because if you've seen almonds, like real almonds, like they're in a freaking hard like casing. Like that is a lot of, or like uh, pecans. I love me some pecans, but damn is that work to get at them. There's a reason for that. <laughs> you know, like your body, like you gotta do some work to get at it. We've made it super easy to get access to it. So our nuts, can they be a part of a diet? Sure. But again, just be careful of understanding that you have processed it to an extent when you've made a butter out of it. And now you are eating way more than you think you are. Don't drown your food in cheese and sauces, bread and flour, etc. You want your food, like you want to, again, look at your plate and know the ingredients. That's what you want to be able to do. Focus on no label food. Most of the food I'm talking about doesn't come with a label, right? Broccoli doesn't usually have a label on it. Well, it might have like a code so that they can check you out. But it's not gonna have a label that's gonna tell you how many calories per serving and how many grams of carbohydrate and all of those lovely things most of the time. And if you do buy food with a label, read the damn label. Turn it over, look at it. Don't just read nutrition facts. Because again, nutrition facts are just going to give you that nutritionism. It's going to be the breakdown of how many carbs and fat and all da 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 You want to look at the ingredients. Read the ingredients. Can you pronounce all the words in there? Are all of the words in there part of the food? Because sometimes real food does have a label. You know, you can find, we're going to talk about it in a second, high quality marinara sauce. That's, that's something that you can easily buy at the store. Don't have to make it. If you read the label, it's got all real stuff in there. Sure, use it, you know? But you have to read that label because it also might have, if it's prego, probably has sugar in it, <laughs> all sort of other crap. So it's really, you have, to, you have to educate yourself. You have to read the damn label. You have to take control over what you're putting in your body. You cannot trust the food manufacturers to have your health in mind, because they don't. Their whole point is the bottom line. And that's fine, they're a business. That's what businesses do. We can't really blame them for that. But then we have now outsourced our health to them because we trust that they have our health in mind. They don't give a flying shit. Because it makes them money. And that's okay. Again, I'm not, not judging that, but we have to take our health back. Same thing with restaurants. You know, more often than not, they're gonna use canola oil and not avocado or coconut because it's cheaper. Does that mean it better for you? No but they're gonna do some tricky shit to try and backpedal it and explain to you, they're gonna try and tell you, no, it's heart healthy, because it justifies it. Because again, we go back to politics and money and all these other things. Canola oil, why is everything back to World War II? I don't freaking know. World War II was going on, and canola oil, it's actually rapeseed oil. There is no fucking canola plant. <laughs> it's the rapeseed. Canola oil is Canada oil, low acid, there's a couple of different ideas of where it's derived from, but that's what canola stands for. <clears throat> it's really rapeseed oil. And that rapeseed oil was originally, it was used as like a solvent in industrial machinery. And again, World War II coming to an end, crap, we're about to lose our contract. How do we keep making money? Well, if we bleach it, deodorize it, maybe we can make it into a food product. First few attempts were atrocious by all reckoning. They tasted awful. And people had been using rapeseed oil for like lamp oil and stuff like that for centuries, just not as food. And then they found a way to bleach it and deodorize it and strip it of some of those like nasty chemicals and clean it up. And then it could be used for high heat cooking so that you can deep fat fry everything in canola oil. That's where it came from. There's no need for canola oil in our diet at all. So. You gotta be aware of those things. So that's why we gotta, we gotta read those labels. What to avoid? Processed industrial packaged food, blah. I think we get the point at this point. Grains. So why avoid grains? Does anybody have an idea? Okay. <laughs> so there's a couple of reasons. One, they, what? Digestion. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of reasons. One, grains are really new in our diet. We haven't been eating them for all that long. Our bodies aren't really all that great at digesting them. But I'm actually gonna, and there are those who will say they have anti-nutrient properties, meaning that they can kinda, they have qualities that they can lock nutrients up so your body can absorb them. 
So even if it has a certain nutrient that your body might not actually, it's not, might not be bioavailable to you. Also, other things with causing maybe leaky gut and blah, blah, blah. What I want to kind of focus on though is just a sort of more basic perspective. From a botany standpoint, this is again where evolutionary nutrition kind of sets itself apart, as we can kind of talk about botany there. From a botanical standpoint, what part of the plant is the, the grain when we eat it? You know? Yeah, it's, it's the seed, it's the baby. It's the baby of the plant. Plants, wheat and grains, are, they, propagate themselves through different processes. Plants do this, right? <clears throat> Some plants, like fruit, usually they want to attract something to eat it. That's why they're pretty and sweet and all these other things. And they do that really well. Grains spread either on the wind. Like if you've ever actually seen a wheat stalk, it's got those like long tendrils on it that catches the wind and it blows it. Or it gets caught on animal fur and the animal trots away and then it falls off and now we've got it. It's not meant to go through the digestive tract. So plants, can only defend themselves with phytochemicals. Maybe a Venus flytrap has other tricks up its sleeve, but most plants can only defend themselves through phytochemicals. Animals can run away. They've got horns, teeth, they can fight. Once they're dead, they're dead. <laughs> like there's no point in trying to poison you once, you're, once it's dead, because that's it, right? Except for maybe snakes, but that's because they had it as a defense mechanism to begin with, but, or, and other things like that. <clears throat> plants though, their defense, they can't run away. They can create chemicals though, they make you never want to eat that thing again. So it makes sense, and this is what happens, the plant concentrates some of these chemicals in the baby to protect it. So if you go to eat it, it the plant is like, I'm going to make you sick so you never eat my baby again. And so gluten, which I'm sure you guys have all heard of, right, super fatty. That was fatty, not fatty. <laughs> um, it's a big fad these days is the gluten-free diet and gluten and all that other jazz. Gluten, alpha gliadin A is what the protein is called in the plant. Its job is actually to make you sick. It is a defensive protein for the plant. So is it any wonder? Now granted, is all gluten all the time a problem? Well, maybe not. But again, the quantity of gluten we're eating these days is way more than it ever was. So it might not be that gluten in small amounts is going to kill you, but the fact that most of us are dosing ourselves with it all day, every day, whether we even realize it or not. Do you know soy sauce is actually not soy, it's wheat? That's money, cheap. So, you know, we have to be aware that the grains are doing their job. They're attacking your body for a reason. So, and there's just not that much nutrition there. Like if you eat a slice of bread and it has nutrition in it, it's probably because those nutrients have been added in. Those are synthetic vitamins that have been added to it, like folic acid, that's been added in. So that's, that's my big thing with grains, is that it's like, it's this whole job to fight you. And again, we haven't been eating them that long. And once we actually started eating them, we got shorter, we got stupider, we got, you know, our brains shrunk, like all of these things happened when we started making them a much larger part of our diet than ever. And we just eat, way more of that than the other stuff. We just don't do the variety like we should be. And that does include rice and corn and all of those other things. They're all in that quinoa. They're all in there. Even though you could argue pseudo grains on quinoa and stuff like that, they all kind of have that similar thing. They're all the baby of the plant. They're all doing that. Dairy. So dairy is a tricky one for people. 70% of the world population actually has um, a lactose intolerance issue after the age of three. 70% of the worldwide population. That's a lot of people. And yet we tell people you have to consume dairy to be healthy. Again, let's, let's run that through how that makes sense from a biological standpoint or from a physiological standpoint. How does it make sense that as a healthy adult, you should be eating something that your body is actively fighting against you eating? <laughs> huh? So what do we do instead? We take lactate pills. <laughs> or lacto, you know, whatever they are. We drink lactate milk, we do all this other crap to get around the system so that we can still eat our dairy. There's also the side effect that dairy is designed, maybe designed isn't the right word, dairy is meant to raise a baby cow that is born at around 40 pounds-ish, give or take, maybe 50. But you know, born at a certain weight and grow it to 500 pounds in six months time. 
that is an exponential growth curve. And I am not 500 pounds. I am not the size of a heifer. I, that's a lot of, that nutritional package was not ever meant to nourish me. It was meant to nourish a baby cow. So what that means is it's actually higher in, you know, you're gonna get a lot of fat, you're gonna get a lot of protein, you're gonna get a lot of carbohydrate, and you're also gonna get a lot of minerals that are in there in heavy load. That mineral load can potentially cause stress on your kidneys because it's their job to deal with it. And then what happens is the pH in your kidneys gets off. And when the pH in your kidneys gets off, it has to counterbalance it. You know where it takes those minerals from to counterbalance it? Your bones. <laughs> so we're taking in dairy products to supposedly help our bones, but if your kidneys aren't doing a great job at counterbalancing that, that, uh, that load, that acid load you're putting on, it goes and sucks it out of the bones. Totally counterintuitive, right? And you don't, there's nothing in dairy that you can't get in other food. There's just nothing. Except for the fact that it can taste good. <laughs> and I do understand that. Um, I recommend that if you are just dead set on including dairy in your life, try more goat and more sheep because it is a smaller animal. The fatty acid profile in the milk looks closer to human breast milk. So it's a little bit more, you know, nice on our tummies and the mineral load is lower there. But also, I question how much we really need that in our diet on a, like, you know, again, we drench everything in these things. It's not to say that like, if you put a little goat cheese on your salad once in a while, that you're gonna kill yourself <laughs> or use a little butter. Butter is usually grass fed, high quality butter for most people doesn't cause much issue because it's pretty much just straight fat. All right, I gotta keep going, ah, running out of time. So legumes and soy, those have the same issue as grains. It's just that there's not a lot of nutrition there. They're still the baby of the plant. They're still fighting your body. And they're in everything, especially soy. Soy is in flipping everything. And yeah, you could have a conversation, people talk about it being, it's an estrogen uh, mimicker, right? And maybe that's a problem. Some of the science there, I don't know if I think it's all 100% there. So for me, it's like, I don't necessarily know that I wanna go down that path about the estrogen issue, but I will say, that most of us sitting here in the room probably do not have ancestry that's been consuming soy for all that long. And so our bodies might not be very good at dealing with it. And most of us, if we are consuming soy, it's not traditionally fermented soy because fermentation changes things and we're not doing that. So, you know, just be wary of soy. And also soy is just, it's in everything. It really is. I mean, your chocolate bar has soy in it 99% of the time, unless you're reading the label because it creates soy lecithin or lecithin, however you want to pronounce it. It's an emulsifier, makes that smooth chocolate flavor, but you can find chocolate without it. So these are markers that soy is also another marker for just processed crap. Alcohol, ha 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 ha. Oh, I know all the mumbles. no, she's not taking away my alcohol, but red wine is healthy for me. No, it's not. <laughs> That's another place where people who want red wine, they want to be able to drink red wine, have done a really great job of finding studies to prove that they can drink red wine and it's good for them. <laughs> um, Rob over there, who's a big guy in the back, he had shoulder surgery last Friday. We feel very sad for him. Um, we love him, he's, he's my, uh, my partner in Paleo University. And people come to him all the time, he was telling me this the other day, and they ask him, you know, like, man, you're looking good and doing all these great things, like, what have you been doing? And he's like, well, let me ask you first, are you willing to stop drinking? <laughs> and if they, well, no, then there's no point. Let's just not even talk about it. <laughs> Let's just, just walk on, there's no point. The thing with alcohol is it just, it provides a lot of calories you don't need, which I know we talked like calories are not the most important thing, but empty, empty, like literally nothing else is there, right? Um, and liquid calories, period, the body processes in a different way. Where in nature do you find liquid calories? Milk, breast milk, that's it. <laughs> that is it. So after the age of about three, at the, at the oldest, uh, back in the day when we were, you know, still wild humans, after about the age of three, you probably wouldn't have ever had liquid calories in your life. Maybe blood, <laughs> which most people are like, ooh. But that's true, right? We, we didn't have coconut water. <laughs> We didn't have these fruit juices. We didn't have Coca-Cola, certainly. We didn't have Fit Aid, sorry, we didn't. So liquid calories, you know, our bodies are, deal with it in a different way. Because again, it's already broken down, it's super quick to absorb, which we want in our babies. We want our babies to put on fat and get, you know, fat and happy and healthy and have the energy to do all the growth they have to do while also storing up so they can survive. But 
then you have to stop that at a certain point. <laughs> and our digestive tracts develop and they grow and they change and they mature. And so our food should as well. Liquid calories are just generally nasty. And alcohol is in that category. Not to mention the fact that it does all sorts of other things for our ability to train and sleep. And I know people think, oh, I can have a glass of wine, it helps me sleep. No, it helps you pass out. <laughs> that is not the same thing as sleeping. Same thing with Ambien. Like, Ambien does not actually put you to sleep. It passes you the fuck out. And you're not getting restful sleep. Because where do you actually make the gains from the work you did in the gym? While you're sleeping. It's not happening while you're over there lifting the weights. That's giving you the stimulus. But your body's resting and recovering and actually building up when you're in that sleep state. Same thing with consolidating memory. All these other things happen. Sleep is great. That's a whole nother thing. If I could do a whole, like, we would just have a whole nother talk on sleep alone and how important that is. But, so alcohol, you have to get real honest with yourself. Why am I drinking? Is it really valuable in my life? And you have to be clear on it. If you, your answer to that question is, yes, I need that cocktail at the end of the day, then God bless and go with you. And I may or may not be able to do anything. We might not be able to get you where you want to be if you are that dead set on holding on to alcohol. Because at the end of the day, it's a poison no matter how you slice it. It is. So your body has to do extra work. When you take alcohol in, your body is like, okay, all the other things we were doing to function, that was put on hold because the more important thing is to process this poison and get it out so it doesn't kill me. Screw DNA repair. I got to get rid of this poison. So I'm not saying you can never drink. <laughs> That's not my point. But I'm saying let's just reevaluate because mo most of us are probably consuming more alcohol more often than we really are letting ourselves think we are. And that idea that you need to have it at the end of a long day to you know, calm down, well, what happens? You have your glass of wine, you pass out, you don't get good sleep, you probably didn't get enough sleep because you probably didn't allow for that because you had to finish watching The Bachelor or whatever. <laughs> and then you wake up in the morning and you're exhausted. So what do you do? You down a cup of coffee and then like maybe three more. <laughs> and then, oh God, it's three o'clock and I'm about to pass out, I need more coffee. And now you're wired and you have to have that glass of wine to put you back down again. It's just a cycle of uppers and downers. So liquid calories, we talked about that. Soda, absolutely, is in that category, right? And I do include diet, even though it technically has no calories, because that sweet flavor starts the body thinking it's going to get something sweet. So it starts some of the processes to deal with that, and then it never gets it. But your body has still already started changing inside. You have already started releasing some insulin and doing other things. And not for nothing, all of the crappy fake sweeteners, and yes, I, stevia is not, a, I'm not a fan of that either, but especially all the other ones, the aspartames and the pink packets and the blue packets and the yellow packets, all the fucking packets, they do some nasty stuff to the microbiome from everything we're seeing these days. And how many people do you guys know who, not for nothing, are significantly overweight and are morbidly obese? And they don't drink regular soda. They're drinking all that diet soda. Has it really done anything for them? It's given them the excuse that they can still drink soda. It's like that Halo Top ice cream, right? What should be the thing we reach for when we're thirsty? Water. Come on now. But because most of us have been drinking sweetened things from the time we were children, we equate sweet flavor with satisfying thirst, right? Like that idea of a cold, crisp Coke on a hot Texas day. Uh, yeah, that still appeals to me too. That sounds great. But it's actually going to dehydrate me more. Here's a trick with Coke. They put a lot of sodium in it <laughs> to dehydrate you so you drink more of it. Bastards. Again, it's all about the bottom line. Sugar. We've talked about sugar a lot, right? When I say the word sugar, again, I'm not talking about the fruit. I'm talking about all the added crap that goes in. I mean coconut sugar. Have you guys seen coconut sugar popping up lately as this healthy alternative? It's still sugar. It's still derived. I don't know about you, but coconut's not that sweet, really. Like, it's got, it kind of has a nice little sweetness to it, but it's not that sweet. So how much coconut are they having to process down, and how much are they having to remove to just concentrate those sugars? It's still frickin' sugar. Maple syrup, have you ever had maple syrup straight from the tree? It's actually not syrup, <laughs> it's water. It's basically maple flavored water. They actually sell a product now called maple water. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, it's, it's water. Then they have to process it down and they have to concentrate it. 
Same thing with, like, honey's a little different because honey's already concentrated, but you have to go through the bees to get the honey. So, again, it's an amount thing there. So don't freak out <laughs> after all these things I've told you to. I want you to start thinking, we're gonna go through this. You're gonna go, through, go to the produce section, the fishmonger, the butcher case, and really actually look around at everything that's there. Because I'm gonna bet you that most of the food that's in those different sections you don't eat on a regular basis. We inadvertently limit ourselves. We have our go-tos, right? Have you, how many of you guys eat kohlrabi on a regular basis? How many of you even know what kohlrabi is? Okay, good. It's like, because I could be making shit up. <laughs> That's just, I'm gonna throw random words at you. Kohlrabi, it's a vegetable. It's, it's good. <laughs> but no, most of us don't eat it, you know? So there's a lot more in those sections than we think there is. And we can, not, when we can go in and we can look at that, Rob Wolf, if you guys have heard of him, he's one of the big daddies of the paleo movement. What he says is, you're not bored, you're lazy. There are plenty of options out there. Let's be real. Let's not sit there and say, but what do you eat every day? Come on, stand in the produce section and look. Look at all the options that are actually available to you. And how many of those things are you really eating on a regular basis? Mix it up. It's not that hard. So how do you use it? Start somewhere, like literally, like I don't care really where it is. Like start, you can start small, you can start big, just start somewhere. Density and consistency come first though. So if you start somewhere, you can just, just like set a small goal. Like I will eat, you know, half my plate as vegetables two days a week. Start there, like that's where you gotta start. And there's an app that I love called Way of Life. It's like a little lifestyle tracking app. It's not like my fitness pal. You get to put in, I will eat vegetables as half my plate twice a week. And then you get to check, yes, I did it, yay. Or, oh crap, I didn't this week. I got no vegetables. So it allows you to kind of build habits that way. And so then you can actually look at the end of the month. You're like, well, I don't, I'm not any better. Well, it's because I didn't fucking do it. <laughs> you can actually track yourself. So that's a way that you can kind of keep data there. So start somewhere and know that those two come first when it comes down to it. Don't let yourself get away with poor choices, but be kind, right, to yourself when it comes down to it. Own it, learn from it, and be better next time, right? Don't beat yourself up because, shit, I had that glass of wine and I didn't want it. Because then that's gonna snowball you and you're most likely gonna say, well, screw it, this week is out the window. I might as well just go party it up and have pizza for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> None of us got here overnight. You're not gonna get out of here overnight, right? I have people who come to me and they're like, man, I, I got this 30 pounds I gotta lose. I'm like, how long did it take you to get there? Well, the last time I weighed what I wanted to was maybe 10 years ago. And you want me to try and take 30 pounds off you in six months? Okay, <laughs> that's really aggressive. Not to say it's not possible, not to say that you won't eventually take that weight back off, but let's realize that we didn't get here overnight. You're not gonna unget here overnight, particularly because that means that you built habits probably not even over 10 years, but over a lifetime, from the time you were even in utero, you were being exposed to certain things. So you gotta take some time to undo it. This is, this is a practice, this is a lifelong learning thing. And eventually it becomes easy, don't get me wrong. It's not gonna always be super hard and have to think about it, it does get easier. Consistency over time will be to diet time and time again. Over and over and over again, consistency. Just consistently get nutrition in your life and it's gonna beat that, whatever that latest fad is, every time. You, but again, you have to change how you actually approach food, how you think about food, how you orient yourself to food. What is food? It's not sandwiches, it's meat and veggies and some fruit and a little nuts and seeds. That's what food is. My plate should be veggies and meat. I'm roasted, we're gonna talk about, roasted veggies are my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Put, I, last night for dinner, Roasted um, bell peppers with a nice piece of branzino next to it, Mediterranean sea bass. I mean, I had to do literally no cooking because it was like, put it in the oven, let it roast. The branzino took four minutes under the broiler, done. Had some chimichurri left over from cooking all week, threw that on there, it was awesome. Make more nutrient dense choices or make more of your choices based on nutrition and health more often. Really be honest with yourself. Why am I drinking this Starbucks? <laughs> Is it because there's nutrition there? <laughs> Or am I justifying it? Oh, it's got milk, so you know, I got some protein. So just make those choices more often. Evolutionary nutrition, paleoprimal, are not based on 100% compliance. That's a misconception. That you have to, the nev you can never eat these things, ever again. 
Well, no, that's not true. Sure, because when you start eating more nutrient-dense foods more of the time, your body can buffer those less than ideal choices every so often without going down the rabbit hole. You have to be careful about this though, because again, that sugar, you can start going, slipping down that slope real fast. So you do have to be careful with those choices, but you can still make them and you can still be healthy doing that. And also, even from an evolutionary perspective, we always had foods that are called fallback foods, which means foods that were not perfectly ideal <laughs> all the time. And sometimes having foods in there that are a little bit less than ideal, again, it stimulates the body in a different way, yeah? Maybe not Oreos, but you know. <laughs> so it's not 100% compliance. I do say for most people though, starting with 100% for at least two to four weeks is a great place to start because you, you have to break some of those habits. And for some people, when I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes we can't start there because they've got, like, we've got to just get rid of the Coke habit first. And I don't mean Coke habit. <laughs> um, we got to get rid of that habit first, you know, because for some people drinking six cans of Coca-Cola a day is normal. So when I say moderate Coca-Cola intake, they're like, so you mean four? Like, no, I mean, like, you can't remember the last time you had one because it was six months ago. That's what I mean. Um, so yeah, starting with 100% in the beginning can be helpful. It just, ha it, it can be shitty because if you're used to eating a lot of dense like carbs and stuff that turn into quick sugar, your body's gonna be pissed at you because it doesn't know how to utilize fat and protein as a fuel source, but you know what? Your body's really good at it. The problem is all the machinery that your body needs to burn carbs, you're using them all the time. Your body loves those machines. It knows how to use those machines. And then when you start taking those dense carbs and that sugar out, your body's like, we don't even have the plans for building the machines to burn fat. Crap, where do we find those? So you have to give your body the stimulus to go into the, the genetic coding and build those machines and then start getting better at using the other fuel sources. Our bodies are really good at using fat. You might be, yeah. And so, absolutely, and I want you to. I do not starve yourself, that's on here. Don't starve yourself. That's the thing, a lot of people get crabby. Yeah, I mean. My levels feel lower when I'm not eating that sandwich bread. Right, exactly, because your body is, your body is gonna drive you to wanna go eat the bread because again, it knows how to use that machinery and it's lazy. But I feel like I'm eating a ton though. Yeah, I feel like yeah. And that eventually settles out. It does, especially, and again, if you focus on eating good quality meat, and it's like in the beginning, I tell people, I'm like, let fat go, eat all the fat, eat all the, put guac on everything. I've had meetings where I walk in, which is a big old tub of guac, and that's my lunch, like, do it. It keeps you satiated. It might, yeah, it can have some bowel issues. <laughs> so you gotta be careful of that. Um, planned mental rest can help. Now, I call it mental rest. Okay, if you guys have to go at two, I totally understand. But, you know, I'm going to keep, we're going to go, I don't have too much left. <clears throat> but planned mental rest can help. I say mental rest and not cheating because I think there's, there's a mentality thing that goes on there, right? Like if you're having to, you're cheating on your health, you don't cheat on your partner, right? Like there's not like a, I'm going to go out there and cheat on them once a, once a week. I'm not going to go have my cheat night with my girlfriend. No. Well, if you, I mean, maybe you do. That might be in your marriage. I'm not sure. Not in mine. That would be grounds for divorce right there. So why are we cheating on our health and why are we cheating on our diet? On the other hand, I do understand that when you change how you approach food, it can be really mentally taxing. You make three, 200 or so food and drink related decisions a day. Most of us are on autopilot for 99% of them. I'm asking you to now make every single one of those choices a conscious choice for a while. Damn, if that's not exhausting. So sometimes it's nice to say, fuck it. <laughs> I'm not gonna make my choices based on health. I'm gonna make my choices based on, pancakes sound really good today. Or hey, it's my birthday and I want a piece of cake. Okay, cool, I'm down with that, sure. But we have to get to the point where those choices happen much less often. Because let's be real, most of us could justify making those choices like three, five, 20 times a day. I woke up late, I gotta go grab something quick from Starbucks. Oh man, it was Michelle's birthday in the office. I gotta eat a cupcake because you know, it's her birthday and I gotta show her that I care. And oh man, you know, I, I, you know, I have been good all week. I haven't had you know, anything. I'm gonna have a donut. It's Friday, they brought donuts in. Yet you had a bagel for breakfast the day before and you had cereal for breakfast the day before that and you had toast for breakfast. It's all the same damn thing, right? We can always justify to ourselves. We're really good at fooling ourselves into thinking that we're making smart choices more often than we are. 
So mental rest, what I say is just, again, not for those first couple of weeks, at least two to four. You want to, <laughs> you need to, you need to have a long enough break that you don't go start going down that slippery slope. And then you're gonna, you know, once every couple of weeks. But why once? I mean like one day. Because six to one, that's a good ratio. I like that number. Because we're actually eating more nutrition most of the time, right? If you did one day a week for a year, that's only 52 days out of 365 that you're making choices that are not nutritionally based. That's good math. I like that math. You're gonna get your goals with that math. And then eventually you get to the place where you can be a little ad lib with it, where you can kind of like, eh, I feel like it today. But it, that's because you get to a point where you, normal is always going back to nutritionally dense stuff. So if you go down the rabbit hole a little bit, you can bring yourself back. That takes years typically for most of us. Because again, we didn't get here overnight. Um, real food first approach. You don't need health products or supplements. You really don't. <laughs> Let's, I mean, most of the time you're creating expensive urine or poop, in the case of probiotics. What about the argument that like, the soil now is so bad that you're eating broccoli, but you're like, not getting it? And that is, that is true. There is the argument that we've stripped the soil so much that there's no nutrition there anymore. Um, and so there are certain nutrients. Iodine is one of them to be, that you might want to be wary of. And so yeah, you could think that there are certain things. But if you are still eating a diet that's varied and you're still including like, like with iodine, if you're still including seafood and fish, you're going to still be getting a good amount of iodine in your life. So it kind of can balance itself out. But you're right. I mean, we are doing things so like our, the nutritional quality of the food isn't as high as it used to be. So again, if we can go to that ideal and we can do local and we can do beyond organic local, right? Like, you know, the farmer, you know, their methods and all the things you're going to get more nutrition in the food too. So yeah, you are right. But Subs often in this space, we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about that kind of issue. We're talking usually about like, what? Pre-workout, muscle milk, creatine, BCAAs, all those other things. Those might have a place for like 1% of people. But I'm gonna bet that most of you guys are not, your nutrition is not lacking because of a lack of creatine <laughs> in, your, in a supplemental form, right? It's not, it's not from a lack of protein powder. Reading labels, talked about that. Veggies, veggies, veggies. There's one of the articles you're gonna get is called step one, eat your damn veggies. <laughs> because for a lot of people, that's just where you fucking start. Because most of, that is really the biggest hole for most people is we are not eating vegetables. And if you fill your plate with veggies, you can eat all the veggies that you want in the world with that caveat of those ones we talked about. Go for it. They're great. Fill up on the veggies. Make half your plate vegetables. And then the other half meat, you're good to go. Or all of your plate vegetables, I don't care. You can eat all the veggies you want in the world. Go for it and vary it up. Because if you just stick to broccoli all the time, people might hate you. <sighs> Liquid calories, if you know what I'm talking about with broccoli. Liquid calories, we've talked about this too. So alcohol, powders, et cetera, all of those other things. Powders also, have you read the back of a, li of a label of those protein powders, what's in them? What? Yeah, right, exactly. Tried to, needed a dictionary and a master's degree to do it. And then Paleo University. <laughs> Sorry, I have to plug my people. Um, we, uh, one of the things that I've worked on and I, uh, I created, you know, Rob and I created Paleo University from my perspective. For me, what it was, was it's a way for, um, it was a tool for my clients because people don't know how to cook real food. And when I tell them to eat real food, they're like, but what do I eat? I'm like, you eat meat and veggies, but what do I eat? <sighs> meat and veggies. What do I, <laughs> okay. And they wanted recipes and they wanted guidance. And so what we've de developed is it's five recipes a week and you don't have to do the thinking. We give you the shopping list on t as well as that and a prep list. And I don't do the whole cook everything on one day thing. What instead I do is I'm like, cut all your veggies on one day. So you've taken that piece of the puzzle out and it usually takes less than an hour to get everything together for those five recipes. And then you can cook throughout the week in really quick time. And most of the cooking techniques are use are put it in the oven and walk away. <laughs> and you can kind of do other things while you're doing that. Um, but also video instruction on everything. So if you really don't know what kohlrabi looks like and I'm talking to you about it, you can watch little videos like, oh cool, that's what kohlrabi looks like, sweet. So and you get to like listen to me all the time. <laughs> and I promise the videos are short. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's a great resource. That's one of the things that we've dealt specifically. Final few tips and tricks. Do not starve yourself. 
right? If you're hungry, eat more. When you're eating real food, eat more. Eat more. We unintentionally starve ourselves because we think of it as a diet, and diets are restrictive. When you're eating vegetables and meat, eat more. I do not care if you eat a whole chicken a day. Go for it. Have fun. You probably won't do that for very long, though. <laughs> eat until not hungry, which is not the same thing as full. It's flat belly full. Think about the feeling you had before you started eating, right? That kind of, ooh, okay, I'm hungry. We well, should. You should be feeling hungry. You shouldn't be forcing yourself to eat if you're not hungry. So you get that little sensation. Start eating and think about when, when you're eating, does that sensation go away? It's a lot faster than most people think. Because most of us equate full with stuffed, over full. So we want this flat belly full. There's another article in the packet that's about flat belly full. Think outside the breakfast box. That's the biggest problem for most people, right? Breakfast is cereal and toast and all these other things. There's other things. So one of the things you're going to get from us is a little packet. It's an ebook of nine egg-based egg breakfast recipes. So giving you guys ideas for things you can do for breakfast that are not, you know, pancakes <laughs> or muffins. Also, though, you can do salad for breakfast. I know it sounds super weird, <laughs> but when it's August in Texas and it's like already 94, 95, 100 degrees at like 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> salad is, sounds pretty damn good. I like it at least. And leftover dinner from the night before. A lot of times when I start working with performance athletes, I'm like, man, I, I eat the weirdest shit. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, I like, I like had stew for breakfast. Like, no, I love that. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Because they understand that breakfast, lunch, and dinner are human creations. What we eat when is just, it's, we've made it into a thing. And it allows people to sell more products. Because I can sell you on the thing you need to have for breakfast versus the thing you need to have for dinner. It's all the same. Um, roasted veggies. They're my favorite thing in the whole wide world. If you don't think you like vegetables, try roasting them. You probably will find you like them. 425, line a baking sheet in foil. They've heard this a thousand times. Line a baking sheet in foil, spread the veggies out on it, throw it in the uh, drizzle with oil, sprinkle with salt and pepper if you want, throw it in the oven for 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the vegetable, done. So easy. Buy pre-cut veggies, okay? I know it might feel like I'm taking away all your convenience foods, but pre-cut veggies, they're in the store. I get my onions diced, <laughs> even when I'm filming on camera. Don't let me fool you. I am not doing that shit. I hate dicing onions. I buy them pre-diced. Maybe it costs a little bit more, but truth be told, if I have to dice it at home, I might not even end up using it. I'll probably just throw it away. So I'm actually saving money by buying it pre-diced. And really, when you do it in the wash, it's not that much more. Because if you're eating real food and you're not buying like organic mac and cheese, you're saving money. It's actually not that expensive to eat this way. It really isn't. Good quality marinara, I mentioned that before. Read the label. Once you find one you like, you can always use that one. Keep a couple of uh, jars in the fridge, or in the fridge, in the pantry, because then you can just pair it with ground meat and veggies and you've got a quick flavorful meal and you had to do very little work. Just cook the meat, throw the veggies in, marinara sauce, simmer together for, you know, 10, 15 minutes after the meat's been browned. Done. And then you can also eat all that later. Snacks are just small meals. <laughs> you don't need special foods for snacks. That's again a way for them to sell us products. You don't need snack foods. That's just another time you're eating. It's just another meal. So eat the same things you would for snacks. Just maybe eat less if you're not hungry. Liver. We're gonna talk about liver for just a second. I have yet to find something in this world that is more nutrient dense than liver. I know people balk at it, they're like, oh. We usually would have always been eating a lot more organ meat than we do now. We eat a lot of muscle meat. And not just liver, we would have been eating all the organs. I recommend you at least consider it in your life. In the packet, I give you a couple of different ways to incorporate liver. I did, there's one thing that I didn't include in there, which is you can take um, chicken liver um, and puree it, which is really ugh, but then mix it in with ground meat. You can do like a couple chicken livers to like a pound, like I would start with one or two chicken livers to a pound of ground meat, and then cook that up and it kind of hides it a little bit in there. But honestly, for the nutrient density comparison, nothing beats liver. Chicken. Chicken versus beef, they're a little bit different. I say start with chicken because it's less intense flavor. But I actually even recommend a liver worse than a brown schwager from a company called US Wellness Meats that are even less intense flavor wise. And that's the thing that when Tim, uh, it's in the packet. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when I started, that was the thing when Tim was like, how do you still have this energy at eight o'clock at night? It was liver. I do liver almost every single morning. It's part of just my routine. Had it this morning. Um, 
So, but I do the sausage, because that's just simple. And then I mix it with like stone, stone, it does, stone ground mustard, sauerkraut, German girl. So, gotta do that in there. Um, so I, just, I have to throw that in there. If you wanna talk multivitamin, if you wanna talk nutritional supplementation, if you wanna anything, liver's where it's at. You just can't beat it. And I would always recommend you eating the actual liver and not just taking a pill, because real food is better. So I have to throw that in there. Again, you're gonna get a little thing in your packet about incorporating it. You don't have to do it. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. But I do know that the people I work with who are willing to try and start incorporating it sooner, they start seeing results a lot faster. Because again, most of us have probably not been getting full nutritional density for a long time. And this basically starts to amp up your nutritional, you know, it ramps up your nutritional intake. And so it just sort of expedites the process. You'll still get there if you eat real food, but this just gets you there faster. You always have the option to make a better decision. I don't give a crap if you woke up and something went wrong and your kids were crazy and you were running late to work and you just said, F it, I'm gonna go get a donut and a coffee from the Krispy Kreme because it's easy. Does that then give you an excuse to eat pizza for lunch and cake for dinner? No, that day is not screwed, that week is not screwed. Because you always have, I said what, 200 food and drink related decisions a day? Always have the choice to make a better decision. Okay, that's me being done shutting up. I'm gonna actually change the next slide though. This is how you guys are gonna get the booklet that's gonna have all these slides, as well as all the articles I talked about, and a guide, a more comprehensive guide of like what to eat and what to avoid kind of thing. You're also gonna get your ebook and your one week free at PaleoU, we're giving to you guys. So email Rob to get that. Um, and then I also put my email up here. If you want to contact me, it's just my name at Paleo University. But Rob is, Rob is the one to get your stuff. 